Now this morning, how many of you are ready for the word of the Lord? Ready to receive that which God has? I'm going to jump straight in. We're continuing in our series. We are preaching through the gospel of Mark. And we come to a moment this morning where we are going to get real. In fact, in preparing this message, I almost felt the, the, the emotions probably of many people in this congregation as we deal with the difficulties of life. And so this morning, I pray that this message is going to be hope for the weary, for those of you that are tired, a, a faith injection for those of you that are facing giants in your life, and maybe encouragement to some of you who maybe say, you know what, I'm failing at this Christian thing. I really don't know if I'm doing it right. Does God even care? Does God even think that I'm a, a good child of His? There's going to be encouragement for you today. I'm going to paint the picture for you. Last week, we, uh, uh, Pat preached about the transfiguration. Jesus takes three of His inner circle disciples, Peter, John, and James. He takes them up this mountain, and there on this mountain, they experience the transfiguration. Jesus changed into a form of his glory, and these guys are looking at this absolutely stunned at the glory of, of the Lord as they are looking at him, and they're quite keen to stay, actually. I mean, they say, listen, let's build a, a tent for, for Moses, for Elijah, and for you. We're just going to stay here and enjoy your glory, but that's not the plan that Jesus has. The mission of Christ was to disarm and dismantle the works of the enemy on the earth. And so once the transfiguration was finished, Jesus takes himself and the three disciples back down the mountain where they're going to meet the nine other disciples that have been left behind at the bottom. Now, Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel also gives an account of the passage that I'm going to read today. However, Mark's account is so vivid in detail, it is so touching of the human heart, and I believe it's going to set many people free today. Can we stand together as we read the word of the Lord, Mark chapter 9 from verse 14. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them. And scribes arguing with him. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed. They ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked, what are you arguing about? And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. He fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into a fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if I can, all things are possible for him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw the crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Can we pray? Dear Lord, 
We are so thankful for your word, and we are thankful for this message that comes to us today. Lord, that 2,000 years ago, a father could cry out to you, and you could step in. Lord, I pray today that our faith is going to be lifted, and we shall be set free. Lord, I pray for breakthroughs in the lives of people today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can take your seats. You know, Binks and I very often get together and we take stock of God's goodness in our lives. We often just discuss all the great things that God has done for us as a couple, as a family. We look at um, the families that we have come from, the blessing that comes from that. We, we celebrate our marriage. We celebrate our two beautiful girls. And um, yes, celebrate this incredible community called Junction Church that we have the privilege to lead. And we, we often get together and just revel in that. And there's one area that we often ask, tell the Lord, Lord, thank you so much, and that is uh, property. Binks and I have always loved property. And um, God has been so gracious to us that he has really opened up so many different doors for us to, to have property and, and to create a home, not only for our family, but a place that we can also live out the ministry that God has given us. And we, we often just, just fall on our knees just in thanksgiving for what God has done. And it's like a testimony that we share. I mean, we've, we've got testimonies of, of um, buying a house over email for half price. Um, I remember when I first got the call to come to Johannesburg, it was late in 2015, I think late October, November. I had to be in Johannesburg on the 1st of January, so I took a Sharpie pen and I, on an A4 piece of paper that said for sale with my name on two properties that we had in George, we sold both those properties within a week and then bought a house here in the same week and moved to Joburg. We've got incredible stories of how God just had favor upon us, and we often share the victory of what God has done in our lives. However, I've got a problem with how we share our Christian testimony sometimes about the victorious you know, thing that God has done and the faith that we had for it. Because let me, let me tell you, many of those testimonies don't share half of what actually happened. We often only share the victorious end. Because let me tell you, in many of those property deals, there were sleepless nights, anxiety, fear, lack of faith, doubt, crying out, freaking out. We had, um, you know, b b b people that didn't pay on time and then it almost put deals in jeopardy. We had signatures from overseas that wouldn't be accepted by the deeds office and be kicked out. Um, we even had plans of a house disappear from city of Joburg, never to be found ever again. We had all these things happening and we never often share those things. And yes, there was a lot of faith, but it was mixed in with a whole lot of fear, a whole lot of anxiety, and maybe Maybe you could even call a lack of faith. And so the story of the testimony is a whole lot more colorful than God came through for us. I don't know, is it only me? Or is it true that in our lives, the testimony is a lot more nuanced than what we sometimes give it credit for? So here's the question. How do we make sense of the suffering and the obstacles and the difficulties that we sometimes have to face? How can we keep our faith when we have been disappointed by things in our lives or maybe God didn't answer our prayers the way that we thought he would answer our prayers? And so I'm going to try to answer some of these questions throughout the message. So let's get back to our passage and share a little bit. I want you to imagine the scene. Here the three disciples and Jesus come down the mountain. They meet the other nine disciples. The other nine disciples are now being attacked by all these people because they failed in casting out that demon. Now you need to remember, these disciples represented Jesus in every way. He commissioned them to be able to heal the sick, cast out demons, and to preach. 
So they represent Jesus. In fact, there was an old Jewish saying which used to say, the sent one is exactly as the one who sent him. So their failure actually reflects on Jesus and his ability to do things. And so there's pandemonium breaking out. Everybody's upset with the disciples. They are scribes. These are the, the learned people all the way from Jerusalem. And they are now giving accusations against the disciples and against Jesus. First of all, they came out to, to ask the question, under whose authority can you cast out demons, firstly? Secondly, the fact that you couldn't do it means that this Jesus is probably a fraud. And here in the midst of all of this pandemonium, Jesus arrives, the man himself, and everybody's excited. People run up to him. They greet him. In fact, you can see it's quite positive there, though the way that they are speaking about Jesus, it is quite positive. But let's be honest here, human nature is quite, quite strange. We love building people up. We love to see people succeed. But those very same people, we love to see them fall as well. And that is why bad news seems to sell, is it not? We build up our heroes only to tear them down again. So right here in this moment, there is this atmosphere of faith, but there's also an atmosphere of let's see what's going to happen. Let's see what's going to happen. And in the midst of all of this, this most incredible human interaction takes place, that touches the heart of all of us here. The pain and the distress of a father with everything that he's got to deal with in what is happening to his son. And he cries out to Jesus. And let's pick up the story again in verse 17. And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able to. Now just imagine this man's disappointment. He's probably heard about Jesus. Maybe he has seen Jesus before. And he, is, he has gone to Jesus with an expectation that maybe his disciples can cast out this thing from his son and they cannot do it. Just imagine the disappointment. He went there with an expectation. It wasn't fulfilled. How many of you here have ever experienced that? That disappointment that comes. And so he comes to Jesus with faith, but his hope has been dashed. I'm reminded of the proverb in Proverbs 13, it says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Now, what does that even mean? Hope deferred means when, when we hoped on something and it didn't come through. When your hope is crushed, it makes your heart sick. And I think when I speak about everybody here in this room, there have been times when you have had hope that was deferred, when things didn't turn out the way that you thought they would, they, you know, the prayers that you prayed would answered in the way that you thought they would. And maybe it's done something to your faith. Maybe it's dented your faith. And maybe right now you are dealing with situations and you're asking yourself, will God even come through for me right now? But for the poor father, it doesn't even end there. It doesn't even end there. Jesus then says, bring the boy to me. Now, let's catch up this, the, the, the passage here in verse 19. Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the, the boy. He fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. Now just imagine, the disciples couldn't cast out the demon. Now Jesus, the man himself, arrives, and as you bring your son to Jesus, suddenly the situation turns even worse. I wonder what was going through the man's you know, emotions and through his head. Uh, listen, this Jesus, he can't do this either. Things are getting even worse now, as an aside. Why did this happen? 
Because when that demon saw Jesus, the King of glory, he suddenly revealed himself and suddenly start to try and intimidate the situation like a last death dance. Let's be honest here. Sometimes the darkest times in our lives is because God is about to come and the devil knows it. Okay? Just a thought, but I digress. Notice the care that Jesus has. How long has this been happening? I think Jesus probably knew. But this is pastoral moment. How long has this been happening to this boy? Yes, Jesus cares about casting the thing out, but he also cares about the deep suffering that this father and the son has gone through. And the father answers Jesus. And it's in this moment of suffering and deep disappointment that the father suddenly blurts out that which is in his heart. Now watch this. He says, but if you, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. Now the man's request is a request of hope mixed with anxiety, mixed with fear, but also an accusation against the disciples and against Jesus. He's saying, listen, if you can, if you can, can you do this? He's kind of revealed this lack of faith inside of him. Jesus picks up on his words and he says, if you can. If you can. There's a theologian, his name's William Lane. I'm going to read it. It's not in the PowerPoint, but I'll read it to you. Um, he describes verse 23 like this. As regards to your remark about my ability to help your son, I tell you everything depends on your ability to believe, not on mine to act. I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. Okay. It's a Mufasa moment. They will say it again. As regards to your remark about my ability to help your son, I tell you, everything depends on your ability to believe, not on mine to act. He's saying, I am Jesus. I can do absolutely anything. The question is, do you believe? Do you believe? But let's be honest here. It's a bit easier said than done, isn't it? It's a bit easier said than done. And straight after Jesus says these words, I believe that this is now my opinion. I believe this is the most sincere, the most honest, the most heartfelt, the most moving statement about the faith journey of human beings that is actually recorded in the scriptures. Jesus says this, uh, but the, the, the father blurts out, he says, immediately the father of the child cried out and he said, I believe, please help my unbelief. In essence, what the father is saying, he realizes the jig is up. Jesus has just publicly called out the fact that he doesn't have enough faith. He knows this is true. He knows he doesn't have enough faith and he has been exposed. His weakness has been exposed. And I wonder what was going through his mind. Surely this Jesus cannot help a guy that doesn't have faith. He says, I'm supposed to have faith. The faith is not there. The jig is up. Maybe God only works for those people with perfect faith that never get shaken. You guys know that guy that I'm talking about. You know the guy that smiles at all his obstacles unshakable faith, never afraid, praise Jesus' glory. And you guys look at that guy thinking, God can come through for him, but not for me. I don't have faith like that. And this is exactly where the man is. And ultimately what he is saying is this, out of his desperation, crying out to the Lord, I believe, I believe, I do. That's why I'm here. That's why I came in the first place, because I actually do believe. But because of my disappointment and my hurt and my stuff, I've got this unbelief lurking inside of me. 
Please help my unbelief. Because if my unbelief is the thing that stands between my son being healed and not being healed for heaven's sake, can you please then help my faith? How many of you have ever felt like this man? How many of you, when I read that passage, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, when you walked into church and you sang that song, and you were like, I believe, but somehow there's still this nagging unbelief inside of me. But here's the thing. Do you know the beauty of this moment when the man makes that statement? Is that he was actually practicing an incredible amount of faith. Think about it. Out of his weakness, out of his humility, realizing his faith is not enough, he comes to Jesus, the only one who can really actually bring deliverance. And he says, I've got nowhere else to go. In my desperation, I've got nowhere else to turn. You are the only one left that can heal my son. Please help me. I believe, but help my unbelief. You can do it, but do something in me too. It's one of the greatest statements of faith, I believe, in the Scriptures. If ever someone ever relied on Jesus, it is right here. And so the big idea this morning that you're going to walk away with is this. Crying out to God during our brokenness and doubt is an act of great faith. When we cry out to the Lord, even during our bouts of weakness and doubt, it is a great act of faith. Um, there was a guy, his name was General George Patton. He was an American general of the Second World War. He did this incredible speech um, uh, before battle in 1944. And I'm just going to read one little excerpt from it. He said this, Every man is scared in his first battle. If he says he is not, he is a liar. The real hero is the man who fights even though he is scared. And yes, there are times when our difficulties and our disappointments and the things that we face, they bring anxiety, they bring fear, they bring levels of doubt, maybe a feeling of faithlessness and hopelessness. It feels like you are disqualified. Somehow that I cannot go to God I feel disqualified. God wants me to run away from his presence because he can see my lack of faith. That is exactly the opposite of what God wants us to do. He wants us to go to him, throw ourselves at his feet, and maybe pray exactly the prayer that that man prayed, Lord, I believe, please help my unbelief. Isn't that exactly what the Christian hero does? Isn't that exactly what courage is? When your faith feels small, when you feel like you've got small faith, that you go and you run to the Lord anyway. You see, the last time I read the gospel, what I saw was that people that are sinners that cannot save themselves go to God while they are still in their sins unsaved and unregenerate, they fall at his feet and they cry out for forgiveness. It was not because of their holiness. It was not because of their perfection. It was not because of their great level of faith per se. It was really people that threw themselves at the, at the feet of the Lord. And that is the starting point of salvation in the life of a new believer. That is the gospel. And in exactly the same way, we need to realize, especially in times of doubt and difficulty, that is exactly then when we need to declare the faith that we have, even the little bit. So Jesus, he says, bring the boy to me. There is more than enough faith. That was just enough faith for Jesus to move. Remember, Jesus would not have moved if there wasn't faith. Think about it. 
he would not have moved if there wasn't faith. This man had great faith even though he believed he didn't. And Jesus takes the boy, casts out the demon, and the young man is healed. Does that give you hope today regardless of what you are facing? Regardless of the things that might come against you, our God is beckoning us to come, especially in our times of weakness. Now, the, the passage ends with this interesting postscript. Um, it's a debrief session between Jesus and the disciples. Now, watch this. And when he entered the house, the disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind of demon cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. So the disciples are perplexed. You have commanded us to cast out demons. You have commissioned us and given us authority to cast out demons. Yet this one we could not. And Jesus says, ultimately, you need to realize, and most theological commentators come to exactly the same conclusion, our walk with Jesus isn't a once-off empowerment. It's not a once-off moment. I came to church once, prayed a prayer, and um, that will sustain me now till the day that I die. It's not a once-off empowerment, a once-off commissioning. It is a daily walk with Jesus where we submit ourselves under his, his authority, under his lordship, under his power, and ultimately what we are saying is, your will be done, not my will, and it's your strength not mine. That is a walk that we do every day. And prayer, in essence, is a great act of faith and humility saying, it is not my ability, Lord. It is yours. Even if you have called me, it is still your power, not mine. The Father, when he cried out, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. It was a courageous prayer of faith. That's what it was. Now, does, is this message a message where we glorify a lack of faith? Absolutely not. Is this a message where, where we are going to say, do you know what, it's, it's a good thing for us to, to, um, yeah, to doubt all the time. That's not what we are saying. Quite the opposite. What we are saying, it's in those desperate, dark moments that we all face in our lives, especially when that shaking of our faith and the doubts of life start to creep in. It's in those moments that we throw ourselves at the feet of the Lord. It's an act of great faith, and you'll be amazed at how God takes that little bit of faith and grows it, and as you nurture it, it starts to grow into a greater faith, that there are going to be other times in your life where you do feel unshakable, where you do feel, you know what, I'm okay. I got this because I know God is with me. It's often in those moments that that type of faith starts to grow. But sometimes we need to get to that place, Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. Let's all stand together. Let's stand together. What are you trusting the Lord for today and what giants are you facing? Has there been a shaking of your faith? A growth of doubt that has shaken your confidence? Maybe it's also started to taint your emotions. Whatever it is that you are facing, and listen, if you came here today and said, listen, my faith is resolute and unshakable this week, praise God, we stand on that. But I suspect for many people in this building, there might very well be a shaking. And the Lord wants to come today to let you know, don't get duped by your emotions, to feel that your faith is less because of your feelings. Faith has never been about feelings. It's been about running to the Lord. Worthy, so